Okay, so we're going to talk about facial trauma today. Um, this is what Dr. Wills does to you if you don't prepare for your in-service exam. So we're going to look at some stats about it and go over your H&P and your physical. Talk a little bit about the physics of why you get fractures. And then we're going to look at a couple cases. Hopefully we have time for all of them, but I don't think we will. Um, basically, back in 400 BC, Hippocrates noticed that the face breaks in the same way every time, or a couple of different ways every time. And they figured out because the face has buttresses. So a buttress is like a rib or a reinforced area that holds things tight and makes them reinforced. So you break around the buttresses. You don't break where the buttresses are. 5% um, of ED visits are account for facial trauma and males much more common than females because males do stupid things. Males in their 20s and 30s do even more stupid things. And a lot of them are car accident related because males drive fast and stupid. And a lot of them occur in summer. Um, the face is really important. Your airway is there. You tend to bleed a lot from your face, all right? Your self-image is there, very important. Um, and four of your five senses are in your face. Our time was planned around it, but of course, we all know that didn't work out very well. So your history, you want to look at mechanism, and you want to tell if they have LOC, right? You want to see if their history is compromised by alcohol. Maybe they're not feeling any pain. Maybe they're not reliable. Uh, accounts of what happened. You want to look for visual problems, decreased hearing. You want to look for good occlusion of the teeth and make sure your teeth are lining up and they can bite without pain. We'll talk more about that later. And then looking for facial numbness and tingling in all three uh, parts of the fifth cranial nerve and always think about abuse in patient populations. So thinking about blunt versus penetrating trauma and blunt trauma, think about the mass, think about the velocity, right? Being hit by a car, is very different from being hit with a wiffle ball bat. There's a lot of altercations in our neighborhood. We see bottles being thrown at the face and hitting in the face. So look for foreign bodies, a lot of falls from height. And then occupational injuries are not very common, but a lot of people in our neighborhood have jobs where they use machines that can actually end up in hitting them off as well. Um, for penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds obviously go much deeper, have much more energy than stab wounds. And then think about explosions because they may have other things with them, like uh, TM ruptures, blast lung. So think about that too. So very little force required to break the nose, only 30 times G, as opposed to the superorbital rib is very, very strong. It's buttressed, so 200 times G, right? It's much more fragile with no nasal bones. And as I go about it, it's a little skinny bone as opposed to the buttresses around the face. A physical exam, you want to look for asymmetry, right? You want to look at it from the top of the bed looking down. I'll talk more about this in a second. Um, look for wounds. If there's wounds there, then they have a good chance of having foreign bodies like rocks or glass. You want to palpate all the bony promises, which we're going to do in a second, and how I was taught to do it. And then we'll talk about the neuro exam. And then specifically, I'm in the eyes, the nose, and the mandible. By the way, that guy did really well. He was a motorcyclist who fell off and he landed face first on the ground and got dragged by his bike. ENT, after nine hours in the OR, put it all back together very, very nicely. That thing you saw hanging off was his upper lip, not his lower lip. All right, so how do you examine the face? This is how I was taught by the OMFS guys. And you want to start on the frontal bone of the forehead laterally. And you want to palpate across the orbital rim, then go down the nasal bone, across the inferior orbital rim, across the zygoma, down the jaw, and then inside the mouth, across the teeth on the bottom, and across the teeth on the top, looking for alveolar fractures as well. The last thing you're going to do is you're going to grab the teeth and pull outwards to see if the whole face slides for our bigger fractures like the fourth fracture. Neuro exam, you guys should all know your cranial nerves by now. All right, make sure they have good tongue protrusion to the left and to the right. For your eyes, you're looking for subconscious hematomas, directional diplopia. Remember, if a muscle gets stuck in a fracture, it won't let the eye move away from there. So that's a good sign they have entrapment. Are the eyes moving together? Are your extraocular muscles intact? Right? If they're not yoked, if they're not going the same direction, then maybe they're stuck. Raccoon eyes is a sign of fracture. So if you see that, you almost always want to scan their head. If you have globe ruptures, don't push on the eyes because you have mixed stuff. Then the inside come to the outside. You don't want to do that. And you're looking for ex ophthalmos and n ophthalmos. Remember, your bony orbit is a box. If you break the box, 
and the walls move outwards, now the box has more volume but the same stuff in there, it's gonna fall in. If you break the box and bleed into it, it's gonna push the eyeballs out. And then always check visual acuity, like I said in the last lecture, um, you wanna make sure that there's no change in your vision. For your mandible, you're looking for malocclusion, all right? You're looking for step off. The ocular surface of the teeth should always be straight. If it's not, that's a good sign there's a fracture. You wanna palpate the condyles, which are just anterior to the tragus of the ear. Right, these are common when people fall face first on their chin, they break off the condyles. And then just know the different parts of the mandible when you're documenting where the fractures are. Because the jaw is held in fixation at the skull, it forms a ring. It's very hard to break a ring in only one place. The only time you really see that is when the symphysis is broken and it just spreads outwards. But it's very hard to break a ring, a ring in only one place. All right, case one, 50-year-old male in an active shooter drill. The bad guys are overacting a bit, and they hit the patient in the mouth of the butt of the gun. Person spitting out blood and teeth, and there's no LOC and no other trauma, except for men. I would tell you that after this, I was like having nightmares for almost a week after this, even though it's a blue plastic gun. It drove me crazy. Yeah. So what is your work for this case? Think about it in your mind. What would you guys do for this patient? Always do A, B, and C. Since they're spitting out teeth and blood, pay a particular close attention to airway. Like people say, well, they can talk the airways clear. That's not necessarily true, right? People who are bleeding in their mouth, give them the suction device, let them suction out their own mouth. Make sure their airway stays open. Do you a good H and P like always. And then mandible fills versus CT is debatable. Almost always will end up doing CT facial bones now. But I will tell you after being an oral board examiner last week that for one, there are still films on the oral boards and probably the written boards too. And for two, new attendings have to be really bad at reading films. So as a push for the next couple of months or next rest of your residency, I'm gonna push you guys to read films more often and not just look at the readings. Because the new attendings that we tested, they're terrible, they missed new authority, they missed everything. I was so shocked at how bad they were at reading films. So I'm really gonna push you guys to read actually. Here's what your x-ray or sorry, here's what your physical exam looks like. What do you guys think of that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> the teeth are out, but notice they're all out in the same direction, multiple teeth at once. Right? So it's probably not just the tooth knocked out. This is an alveolar fracture. The alveolar bone is what holds the teeth in place. And usually they move on block, meaning a bunch of them move together when you hit them. All right. So again, it's the bone that holds the teeth. Um, it can be anterior, most common, but you can have lateral too, especially if you're hit from the side by a car or by someone swinging at you. Um, teeth can be luxated. If they are, you want to secure them in place and don't let them fall out or don't let them move. They're an aspiration risk, right? You have to account for all the teeth. If you don't see them all in the mouth, and you don't find them all on the floor, you have to go look for them. So I usually do a chest x-ray on these guys to see if they aspirated it. And then not everybody aspirates, but they're sometimes hard to find this one actually got pushed up into their sinuses and it was in this uh, inside of their head. So just make sure you account for them all before you send them home. So a little teeth terminology, a concussion is not loose, but they have pain and they probably injure the dental ligaments that hold the teeth in place. Subluxation is loose, but not displaced. Intrusive and extrusive luxation are in or out and exarticulation is when it's gone bye-bye out of the mouth. So you want to stabilize the teeth. You can use a figure of eight using silk. That's probably the easiest way. You can use arch bars like you see here, but I think they're pretty hard to put on and probably above our scope. Um, you can also use internal plates, which is again, outside our scope. Um, probably the figure of eight is the best thing for you guys to do. Salt water rinses, because they almost always have the tooth out of the socket, at least partially. So you don't want it to get infected. And then analgesics, these things hurt like hell. I'm sure you guys realize. And then soft diet, almost best follow-up. But as long as you can get the teeth back in place, you don't have to do anything with it. Sorry, this is a great question, but what do you think of it? So what you do is you have the tooth that's loose or out. You go around the tooth next to it and go forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, around the other tooth on the other side. And then it's like kind of a three-part figure of eight where you just tie it in place and hold it there from coming out more. So you're just tying the teeth, basically. Correct. Uh, there's no <clears throat> suture anything. No, no, there's nothing in the gums. There's nothing in soft tissue. What are you using? Usually I use silk, like a 3 0 silk. That usually fits pretty well between. Um, if their teeth are super tight and you can't get a 3 0 silk in there, you can use nylon, but it's a little hard to tie. And nylon tends to slip and not hold. 
So the tooth may fall out anyway. So here's what splinting looks like. You can use dental cement and just any piece of wire, and just the dental cement will stick to the teeth. It's not a big deal because the dental dentist is just going to scrape it off the next day. Doesn't matter how it looks, doesn't matter how it goes. As long as you just get the teeth back where they belong, you can see that the alveolar fracture here, all this stuff is purple. This is all the alveolar fracture, and then these are just holding it in place. All right. Case two this person is going for the pull up record of the world. They're not drunk, and they, the sign falls over and lands on their face. They have positive LOC, they have epistaxis, and they're brought in by EMS. They're very upset because they didn't get the pull up record. By the way, just so you guys know, uh, Inger Simming got the pull-up record at 22 in New York City, 39 in one minute, one minute. I can't do it. All right, so here's the physical exam looks like. Different patient, of course, male to female, but nose is out of place, very tender, a little bit of crepitus. The actual ocular muscles are intact though, and there's blood coming out of the nose. It's not uncommon. There's no septal hematoma because you looked, but there is clear flow coming out. So is it tears? Is it something else? And how would you test it? Think about it. So what would your workup be? Think about it in your head. You do your ABCs because they have bleeding in their facial area, your h &P, and then they have a positive LC, so you're going to get a head CT. I would probably scan the spine too. A large object fell on their head. You don't know if they have a spine injury. And then they're going anyway, so I would just scan the face. Um, will they sit still for plain films? Always think about that. Will they be able to arrange their neck for plain films? Always think about that. Most of us won't even get plain films, but again, there are films on the boards, and I want you guys to be ready for it. Call a face consult, ENT or OMFS. Primary close up that lack on their nose and then upgrade their tetanus. So here's the lateral film. What do you guys see? Excellent. Here's what the CT looks like of that guy that you saw in the picture, right? A little bit of a deviation there. Probably needs some sort of plastic reconstruction. So the nasal bone, most easily broken bone in the face. It's got the least amount of uh, force needed. Usually happens in young males because they're doing stupid things again. Um, but what you don't want to miss is the NOE, the nasal orbital ethmoidal fracture. And we'll talk about that more in a second because those are big fractures. They have CSF leaks and not tears. And we'll talk about how to examine that in a second. Um, a lot of swelling and tenderness. The bridge of the nose may be wide because the bones are displaced. They'll have epistaxis because when the bones break, they tear the mucosa inside the nose. And then radiographs are not necessary for everybody. If you don't, if they're not displaced and there's no reason to do them, then don't do them. Just to prove they have a broken nose, you could just palpate it, tell them it hurts and it's broken, and they can see ENT in the future. So the NOE, the NOE is a very, very bad, big fracture. And usually what happens is you have some force in the upper middle of your face, but it doesn't just hit you lightly. It penetrates deep into the face and it destroys the whole ethmoidal sinus complex and breaks it in. So this is bad because there's a lot of things associated with that. First of all, the cribriform plate is over it, right? So now you have a leak going from your nose into the head where your brain sits and you have all your sinus garbage in there that goes up into your brain, gives you meningitis. Um, the medial canthal ligaments except, uh, attached there, that's what holds your eyeballs in place. So when the bones move outwards, so do your eyeball. If you now change the place where your eyeballs are in your orbit, that's going to change how your extraocular muscles work. They may be a problem. Plus your um, intrapupillary distance may be widened as well, giving you telecanthus. Your lack of apparatus is also broken because the ducts are from the eyes into the nose. So that's going to stop tears from going down or stop liquid from going down into your nose. It's going to cause the tears to overwhelm onto your face. And that's called epiphora. And then also your sinuses are also going to be wrong. So why do you get CS coming down? Because there's a dural tear. The cribriform plate broke, it ripped the dura, and your CSF is now coming out your nose. But if there's a bunch of blood in there and the blood clots, as you reabsorb the blood, you may get a delayed CSF leak. So make sure you look out for that. And then how do you test snot versus CSF? Your secretions shouldn't have sugar in them. If you did, you would have yeast growing all over your body all the time. So if your finger stick of that solution is greater than 45, you should suspect that it's CSF and not just tears. They say it has a salty taste. Sure. I mean, so does snot, but what are you going to do? Um, the way to test it on the boards is there should be concentric lin concentric rings on linen. None of us carry handkerchiefs anymore. None of us have filter paper, so we don't really do it. 
And then one thing I read said it will stiff in a handkerchief. If it's not when it dries, I'm not waiting for it to dry. I just do the CT head and see what's in there. Um, you have your risk of meningitis, so they all get endomized because that cribriform plate is broken. All right, case three is our 48-year-old male who's sparring. He is thrown and lands on his face. He has no LOC, but he is complaining of jaw pain. He's a grappler. So your physical exam shows trismus, where he can't open his mouth. The tongue depression torsion test is poor. For those guys who don't know, that's probably the best way to diagnose a jaw fracture without radiographs. Um, the right lower lip is numb, and he's got blood coming from around 2, 26, 27. And he's got a lack on his chin. For you guys, remember, numbering of your teeth starts right to left, top to bottom. So your top right is number one. It goes around and there's eight in the quadrant. So one, 16, 17, 32. Here are your films again. I just want you guys to see some films we don't do very often, but they're gonna be on the tests, right? Lateral, jaw fracture there. So 43% of jaw fractures come from MVCs. There's a lot of force of a car hitting you. Remember your energy is MV squared over two. When M is super big, the kinetic energy of the car is huge that all gets transferred to the human body and it gets dissipated by breaking things and destroying things. <laughs> um, the mandible is the most common bone in the face broken, even though the nasal bone is the easiest bone to break. And that's because the mandible sticks out way more from the face than the nasal bone does. This one was actually a gunshot across the jaw. This was not a car accident. Um, just there's different numbers. You don't need to know them all. Just know that coronary is really hard to break because it's all the way in the back and not very common. I put this in there just so you guys understand a little bit more like what OMFS is going to do with them, whether it's favorable or unfavorable. If it's favorable, when the muscles spasm, they pull the fracture together. As opposed to if it's unfavorable when the muscles spasm, they're going to pull it apart. So people with unfavorable fractures are much more likely to get open reduction, internal fixation than people with favorable fractures. People with favorable fractures will often just get their jaw wired shut for two to four weeks while people with unfavorable fractures will have to go to the OR and get their jaw plated with uh, metal. So again, we said before, it happens classically in two places because it's hard to break a ring in only one spot. Um, pins or occlusion, if you look at the teeth and you're not occluding correctly or it doesn't feel like it's lined up, that's a good sign. And then remember the inferior alveolar nerve comes out, goes through the mandible and comes out of the mental nerve. If the mandible is disrupted, that's gonna tear the nerve too. So you'll get numbness of your lower lip and the lower part of your face, all right? Treat them all as open fractures with saliva on them, super contaminated, they all should get antibiotics. They bleed a lot, so give them the suction to hold themselves. Panorex is the best test for it, but we don't do panorex in the emergency room. That's that big x-ray that goes around your head. Um, not even a super rare because the mandible has a very good blood supply. Again, look at your occlusal surface, look for step off. That's a dead giveaway that they have a fracture there. Look for asymmetry, look for bleeding between the teeth. When the jaw breaks, it tends to break in the weakest spot, which is right through a hole for the teeth, because that's where there's least bone. So it's not uncommon to have the blood coming out around the teeth. Um, the teeth may be unstable, the mandible is tender, there may be a, a big hematoma in like the buccal re reflection of the skin in the mouth. They have trismus often because they can't open and close their jaw due to spasm. And then just look anterior to the ear again, looking for condyle fractures to make sure they don't have anything there. So again, how do you stabilize it? Um, Omofest is gonna likely put on IV loops or arch bars, all right? IV loops are just a loop of wire that goes between your teeth and then the wire ends go through the loop. And then you do that upper lower and then just push the ends together and twist them. Those are pretty easy to do. And I think we can do it if we can find the wire. Um, arch bars are a little bit harder to do. They take probably 45 minutes to get them on, but they will hold the teeth much better. If you have no teeth, it's really hard to get the jar set down and closed. So sometimes they may have to put these maxillary screws in, the wire around them, bit out of your uh, working definition, I think. And then if they have no teeth at all, they use these things called gunning splints, which are just dentures for top and bottom together. And they just hold your face from moving because the denture cement holds your jaw closed. For us, Spartan's bandage, which goes around the head, holds their jaw closed, holds it from moving. 
Um, they could follow up with ET or OMFS in the morning. Antibiotics, because they're all open fractures in the mouth with saliva. Probably a lot of analgesics in the liquid diet because they're not going to be able to chew. If they can't tolerate PO and if they're not having any calories, they may have to be in the hospital for angel lipid or IV fluid, IV uh, food. Anybody who's edentulous has no teeth will likely require open reduction, internal fixation, only because there's no way to hold the teeth in place. These guys can go home, give them release instructions on how to get the wires off if they can, and then they just follow up. I'll talk about dislocations really quickly. Um, it's common for anything that opens the mouth really wide, like eating apples or stuff like that, trauma. It's recurrent in people with an underdeveloped condyle or people who have ligamentous disease where it's lax or they have like something like Marfan syndrome or Euler's downloads. Almost all of them, or I'll say, I will say all of them are anterior. Think about where your mandible sits in the glenoid fossa. If it goes posterior that, it's inside your skull, inside your ear. So it's really hard to get a posterior dislocation. Some of them can go lateral when there's a lot of trauma and you break the jaw as well, but it's almost impossible to get into a dislocation in any other direction than anterior coming out, right? You could do your CT facial bones to diagnose it, make sure there's no fractures. And then we'll talk about reducing it in a second. Make sure you get post-op films to make sure you didn't break anything while you're doing the reduction. And then avoid mouth opening for a week after that um, with the Barton's bandage. On physical exam, they can't close their mouth both actively and passively. People with fractures or people with like, um, like abscesses, if you push in their jaw, you can actually close it. It may hurt, but you can close it. People with dislocations, you won't be able to close it even if they, don't, if they want you to. Then they'll have trismus where they can't open their mouth. They'll have this tilted appearance to their jaw. And then the, tendi tend the uh, condyles will be tender because the ligaments and the joint capsule are probably stretched or torn. So to put it back in, it depends on how long it's out for. Um, when it's out for a long time, it's harder to get back in. There's two ways you can do it. You can sit them in a chair and then have their head against the wall. This way you can push down and push backwards to push them against the wall. If you want to push down and backwards in a bed, it's fine, but it's a little hard to get over them. Plus the bed slide. I like the chair and the wall method. It's much more stable and much easier to do. Um, you may need to conscious sedate them if they don't go back in. If you have a bilateral dislocation, do one side at a time. Don't do both together. And finally, if you just can't get it back in, they may need general anesthesia and even worse, open reduction to get it to go back if there's something interposed uh, between them. So usually what I'll do is I'll wrap my thumbs in gauze, I'll put my thumbs on their back molars, and I'll use my last three fingers under their mental prominence and I'll pull up on the mental prominence while pushing down on the teeth. So I'm rotating their jaw, like sort of like inferior. And then while I'm doing that, then I'm pushing backwards around the side. But I think pulling up on the mental part, the front of the jaw, is the key to get them to go back in. Just pushing down doesn't always work. Have you done that syringe techniques? You know, I've tried syringe rolling. There's a bunch of papers that say it works. I've tried it three or four times now. It's failed every time. I haven't had it work yet, so I sort of gave up on it. I know there's papers that say it works, but man, you tried it. I don't find it works very well, to be honest, but if you guys want to try it, go ahead. It's better than getting your fingers bitten. But I think in the end, you're going to probably end up using force, but you could try it first. For guys who don't know what to do, you give them a 3cc or a 5cc syringe to hold between your teeth. And you tell them to kind of juggle it and move it around. And that moving motion is supposed to open the space between the condyle and the uh, uh, fossa and open it up and let it go back in on its own without pushing it. Yesterday I had one, like, every time I felt the tongue, and then I said, oh, I feel much better using the open post, and when it's going to get the rat, open back up some teeth. So chances are the there's a fat pad in there as well as articular cartilage. Remember when your jaw opens, it comes down and slides forwards. So it slides on the cartilage. Very often if that cartilage tears, it gets interposed. Even if you get it back in place, it's not going to be stable and it's going to pop right out. It's actually very common when you tear that card. Usually it's open. They go in with a scope and they just clip off the cartilage, put some fat in there to replace it. Um, but I think it's beyond our beyond our ability. We don't see that. You can. What kind of shirt you got? All right. 
Case four is a third annual man who is slips on the ice. He's AOB and positive LOC. You guys can see why he slips on the ice, right? Yeah. Yeah. On your AP view, this is your film. And your water's view is where you're drinking water and looking up. This is what your film looks like. And if you guys look closely, you'll see a few different fracture lines, right? There's one here, one here, and one here. So you get your CT facial bones, and you see a male process fracture, right? Um, all fractures in the male process fracture originate at the orbital fissure. You all see a W zygoma fracture. This one's not bad, but often you'll see the zygoma pushed in and collapsed, and the two edges will be out as well because you can't break a ring in only one spot. You'll see an air fluid level in the maxillary sinus and a lateral sinus wall fracture. And pretty much what happens is you get hit in the cheek and your cheek gets pushed off backwards and down. And the whole complex comes as one piece because the malar process itself is very, very strong, but the parts around it are not. That's why it always breaks in the same place. So it's also called a ZMC fracture. And you can see that the whole cheek is separated from the face, right? Usually a direct blow. Um, make sure you look at it from the top, from the bottom, from the sides, because they displace in different directions depending on which muscles are spasming or which muscles are pulling. These are often associated with eye injuries because you don't get hit in just the cheek. You can get hit in the eye as well. Um, you have a flattening of the side of the face. Even if it's a little bit or two millimeters off, it needs to get fixed because it's going to appear, your face is going to appear uneven afterwards once the swelling goes down. Since it goes through the inferior uh, rim of the eye socket, that's where the inferior orbital nerve runs and it's often torn. And then um, you'll have anophthalmos because the orbital box, again, we talked about before, as the malar process breaks off, the orbit gets bigger, so your eye falls backwards inside. Here's a nice recon of one. We see one, two, three fractures. All of them go back to the middle in the same place. So fix it. These guys almost all need OMFS. Um, it's going to be functional, too, because... The masseter muscles run here underneath the uh, zygomatic arch. And when it's pushed in, it impinges on the muscle. So you can't, you won't be able to chew. They'll get antibiotics because the sinus are disrupted. Sinus precautions, no nose blowing, right? Open mouth sneezing. Because if the sinuses are open, you sneeze, all that air and the junk in the sinuses is going to go out into your sub space. Um, sometimes they'll do nothing if they're not displaced at all. But it's very, very rare. Almost always. They need the screen at the bottom plus the plates to pull it all back into place. All right. Next case, you have a 35 year mile who's boxing. There's no LFC. There's pain with eye motion. There's no rib step offs. He's got a parallel hematoma. His cranial nerves, his cheek is numb, and he has double vision on upwards gaze only. His TMs are clear. So think about your worker for this case. His neck is probably clearable by next. He only got hit with a hand, not a car. Um, do your ADCs. Make sure there's nothing in his mouth and nothing blocking his airway. Facial films versus CT. Again, we talked about it, whichever you want. Most of us will get CT face now. Um, and then oppo console for his eye. Does he need a neuro console for the numbness and the lack of motion? Probably not. But here's your facial films. In general, when you look at facial films, compare left to right, right? If you look at it, there's a little bit of a density on that right side that's different from the left. Kind of looks like a tear hanging down from the top. So that's an orbital uh, floor fracture where the, the base of the orbit goes down, but it doesn't tear the sinus lining. So therefore, all the blood and the, the fragments get stuck in the subcutaneous tissue. Also called trapped door fracture. So the mechanism, people have two theories. There's a hydraulic theory where you get hit in the eye and it just raises orbital pressure and whatever is weakest breaks, which is either lamina propitia medial or the floor inferior. There's also the rim buckling theory where some object hits the rim, but the rim is very, very strong. So it holds, but it buckles backwards and the floor drops out. It's not uncommon to herniate the eye uh, orbit contents down into the fracture. That's why you have to check them for ocular motion in all directions. And then again, that's exactly where your inferior orbital nerve runs in that floor of the socket. So you want to make sure it's not disruptive. 
<laughs> Look for entrapment, restricted upward gaze for the floor, and restricted lateral gaze for the laminar propitia. Sometimes edema can cause it too. So if you're not sure, you need to get the CT and look where uh, look where the entrapment is. And here you can see you have your floor all the way down there, but it's not disrupted. There's no blood in the sinus, but the muscle is actually in the fragment or in the trap door. The bigger the fracture, the less likely you are to have entrapment because it's not big. It's not like tight enough for the muscle to get stuck in it. All right. Last case is an 80-year-old female. She's Russian speaking. She's pet struck. This positive at LC. She's very tacky and moaning. She's handing her secretions. She has periorbital hematomas on both sides. Her septum looks strange when you look up at it, nasal septum. She has episaxis. She has crepitus of her face, but her cranial nerves are normal. Her vision is intact, but her face seems to move when you pull on it. So what's your workup? Again, you're going to do your ABCs, look up the nose. This bulging red um, thing here is what we're looking for. The septal hematoma this is the only case I've ever seen of it in my whole entire career, but you can't miss it because if you do, the pressure on the nasal cartilage is going to erode it. So we look every single time, even though we almost never find it. They get the Panaman scan, the head, the spine, everything, and a trauma console, a face console. You want to incise the septum and incise that blood or the, the skin over the blood and let it drain out and then pack the nose so it doesn't reaccumulate just like we talked about earlier with packing the ear so it doesn't reaccumulate on the cartilage, you want to do the same thing here. So here's your facial films. And you know what to look for type injuries because there's so many fractures in there. But think about where they are, right? Type ones go through the mouth, type twos go through over the bridge of the nose, and type threes go over the bridge of the nose but farther back. So if you look, this one has the bridge of the nose totally disrupted. Now you got to decide in type two or type three, because you know type one doesn't go through the bridge of the nose. But here you see the lateral walls of the sinus, uh, sorry, lateral walls of the orbits are both out. Therefore, you know, it's a type three. So what this guy Laporte did is he took skulls of human and mounted them to the front of a sled. And then he put the sled on a track and took it up to different heights. And the higher up he took it, the more the fractures were deeper and worse. You like that, huh? Psychopath. <laughs> so this, again, this type one, two, and three, like all grading systems made by surgeons, the higher the number, the worse the fracture is. Um, always look for debris in the mouth because this fracture, the type ones and type twos, both go down into the mouth. And if you tear the lining, you can bleed in there. They're often mixed where type one on the left, type two on the right, they don't have to be the same on both sides. Um, type one again goes from the jaw into the nose and back down. Type twos go from the jaw up over the nose and down. And type threes, so this is a nice type two, right? Sinus walls. Here's a recon through the front of the face into the orbit, over the nose, and back down the other side for dentition. And the type threes are cranial facial dislocations or disjunction. Um, the face is separated from the skull. It is no longer attached to the skull. All right, here's the result of one. Right, the chin is all the way out, and the face is the face is off from the rest of the head. Googling dish faces gets a lot of really weird results. <laughs> Thank you very much. I spoke fast because I thought I had forty-five minutes. I only had half an hour, but we did cover everything, and I had two cups of coffee today. <laughs>